to give it up for Mary Woods. <laughs> well, I, uh, I can't thank Nick enough for that incredible introduction. I'll try to do justice to even a couple parts of that. Um, and this is such a wonderful event here in Vancouver. I have so much admiration for so many of you working on these problems up here. And I just want to make a special thank you to the organizers of this event, um, Friends of Clark County, Clark Conservation Voters, Clark College Student Life, and Sierra Club. And of course, those individuals behind these organizations, Val Alexander and Holly Forrest, and Bridget Schwartz, who I just met, and Samantha Lilo, thank you so much for putting this on. And what a beautiful array of food out there. So please get up and, during my talk, and get up and uh, replenish your food um, anytime you want. So I really, really am honored to be here today. And my talk is about global warming, which I view as the most urgent issue facing our time. Let us reflect back on some of the headlines over the past years. Melting ice caps, raging wildfires, widespread drought, 35,000 Europeans dead from a heat wave, Jakarta underwater, polar bears drowning, West Nile virus species on mass exodus towards the poles, and Hurricane Katrina. Yet many Americans are still asleep to climate crisis. They are in for quite a shock when they wake up to realize the consequences from ignoring, ignoring this threat. Climate is the invisible currency of our lives. It supports our food supplies, water supplies, private property, businesses, and recreation. And yet, for most of us, it's been an absolutely overlooked source of our security and comfort. That is about to change. Last week, Time Magazine issued a special edition on climate change in which it said, never mind what you've heard about global warming, as a slow motion emergency that would take decades to play out. Suddenly and unexpectedly, the crisis is upon us. And so we all stand together at a pivotal moment. In this decade, humanity will decide whether to hand over a world more habitable or a world on its way towards disaster. Our need to define government's obligation at this key time towards future generations and towards nature has never been greater, but we lack a legal beacon to guide us. Environmental law has become so adrift from its moorings that citizens no longer know what to expect from their own government. So today I hope to offer an approach that draws upon timeless principles of property law and sovereign property law to characterize natural resources as inheritance belonging to future generations. Let me explain first the dynamics of global warming. And many of you understand these, but they have to be conveyed to the American public in terms that everybody can understand. Through our emissions of greenhouse gases, we are literally creating a heat trap for ourselves and future generations living on Earth. The sun, of course, sends massive energy down to Earth, and that warms our planet. And that energy is supposed to then radiate back in space. But some of the heat that comes from the sun is held captive by heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere. Before the Industrial Revolution, nature had maintained a balance of these gases. So the Earth's average surface temperature was about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And it may be hard to appreciate the remarkability of a 59 degree average until you consider that all the ecosystems we know evolved against that average temperature. So essentially, 59 degrees is for the Earth what 98.7 degrees is for our bodies. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have burned massive quantities of fossil fuels. And in doing so, we have literally changed the composition of the atmosphere so that less heat escapes back into space. And just as an ice cube will melt in a warm room, so is the polar ice cap. Greenland and every major glacier in the world melting today. Glacier National Park will probably have, according to scientific models, no more glaciers by 2030, just 23 years from now. Carbon dioxide, which is the gas emitted from cars, from coal fire plants, from gas heaters, has climbed to levels unknown in the past 650,000 years 
and we are still pumping it out at a level increasing 2% each year. According to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the average surface temperature on Earth will increase between 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit and 10.4 degrees Fahrenheit within the next 100 years if our greenhouse gas emissions do not turn downward soon enough. Our past carbon pollution has already locked us into a temperature rise of 2 degrees Fahrenheit. We are already locked into that. 2 degrees does not sound like much at all. It didn't to me, in fact, until you realize that the Earth's average temperature has not varied by more than 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 10,000 years. Even just a few degrees of temperature rise makes the difference between the Ice Age and today. Temperature is only 5, to 5 degrees to 9 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than those today. Marks the end of the last Ice Age when all of the Northeast United States was under 3,000 feet of ice. So extrapolate a 10 degree Fahrenheit difference on the warmer side. Once we understand the climate premium that virtually every single degree Fahrenheit carries, we would no more dismiss a 10 degree temperature rise for the Earth than we would a 108 degree fever in our own bodies. So what does this mean for Earth and for you and me? It means that you and I, along with all other living things on Earth, will find ourselves in a greenhouse with climbing temperatures. And this situation is bound to lead to hostility since Americans account for 25% of the world's carbon emissions. There's absolutely no Tylenol that will cure this planetary fever overnight because carbon dioxide persists in the atmosphere for centuries. Hurricane Katrina signaled what we can expect from further warming, and warming already underway as a result of our past carbon emissions. Scientists warn of crop losses, food shortages, flooding, coastal loss, wild, wildfire, drought, pests, disease, extinctions, landslides, vanishing snowpack, and other harms. An international climate team recently said that countries should prepare for as many as 50 million refugees by 2010 three years from now. If we do nothing to curb carbon emissions, we will commit ourselves to a future that most Americans will find unimaginable. Jim Hansen, who's the leading climate scientist for NASA, presents the 10 degree Fahrenheit scenario. He says it will send 50% or more species into extinction. That is the equivalent of the last mass extinction that visited Earth 55 million years ago. In his words, quote, life will survive but it will do so on a transformed planet. He points out that a mere 5 degree Fahrenheit temperature rise would cause a rise in sea levels that would inundate Boston, New York, Washington DC, and most of Florida. 50 million Americans live below that sea level. We could go on dealing with how climate crisis will affect the lives of every single American. What I mentioned to you is literally just the tip of the iceberg. And that is on its way out as a phrase, I'm afraid. British commentator Mark Linus, who is author of the book High Tide, summarizes it this way. He says, let me put it simply. If we go on emitting greenhouse gases at anything like the current rate, most of the surface of the globe will be rendered inhabitable within the re lifetimes of most readers of this article. As a group, Americans yearn to have peace of mind for the future of themselves and their children. Entire industries are built on the inclination of Americans to buy security in the future. And we simply wouldn't have social security, estate planning, retirement accounts, were it not for that strongly held preference on the part of Americans to pay for disaster avoidance. As a society, we are now in the position of buying climate insurance as much as we possibly can. By most scientific accounts, we still have the ability to stabilize Earth's temperature increase at 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that two degrees, because that's the baseline of your future. As Jim Hansen, the head NASA scientist I mentioned, puts it, he says, further global warming exceeding two degrees Fahrenheit will be dangerous. Here is the purchase price of that climate insurance. We have to drastically curb our greenhouse gas emissions now. As a planet, we have been at a similar danger point before, when it was discovered that CFCs were putting a hole in the ozone layer in the 1970s, we stopped using them. 
And that hole is now repairing. Decarbonizing our society is not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be much more complicated because carbon is emitted all over the place. But the basic choice is still the same as presented to human, humankind by that ozone crisis. Do we take bold action now in order to buy climate security for our future, or do we continue on a business as usual course with the knowledge that it will ultimately lead to catastrophe for ourselves and our children that will drain our descendants of the natural abundance that we all took for granted. This choice cannot be characterized as just another environmental issue. Author Ross Gelbspan says climate crisis is, as he puts it, a civilizational issue. Unfortunately, we have little time for indecision. Jim Hansen states, we have, this is a direct quote, we have at most 10 years, not 10 years to decide upon action, but 10 years to alter fundamentally the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. That means 10 years of working back, think of all the changes we need to put into place. That means we have to be acting right now to get those changes on the ground. You might wonder why the atmosphere is giving us so little time. It's because we've already pumped so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that we are very likely nearing a tipping point which will trigger irreversible dynamics because of feedback loops. After that tipping point, our subsequent carbon reductions, no matter how impressive, will not thwart long-term catastrophe. Let me be clear, because some people don't understand this, I do not mean to imply that all climate catastrophe will visit us the first day of year 11 from now. The tipping point means this. If we continue as business as usual, we will effectively at some point within the next decade, and probably sooner rather than later, effectively place a lock on the door of our heating greenhouse and leave ourselves and future generations inside and throw out the key. So our descendants will be in there and they will have no way to get out. This 10-year action window we are now looking at means that if we pour resources into the RON strategy, we cannot turn around and do it all over again. State legislators, federal agencies, governors, county commissioners across the country should be burning the midnight oil or fluorescent lights, uh, figuring out solutions to get us out of this crisis. But with few exceptions, our government is still sleeping through climate crisis. And one such exception, I want to mention is Senator uh, Pridemore in this state. He has taken it on and introducing legislation boldly and bravely and courageously. But most are not. Scientists are trying to think of any ways they can think of to wake people up to this emergency. In January 2007, the Harvard Medical School Center for Health and Global Environment convened clock uh, top climate scientists with evangelical Christian leaders to deliver an urgent call to action to the President of the United States to, quote, protect creation. How many times have you heard scientists and evangelicals get together to ask the President to protect creation? <laughs> In their words, not mine, quote, Earth is seriously imperiled. We are destroying the sustaining community of life on which all living things on Earth depend. Every sector of our nation's leadership must act now before it is too late. Business, as usual, cannot continue yet one more day. The international community is sounding the same alarm. Four months ago, British Prime Minister Tony Blair said to the world, quote, this disaster is not set to happen in some science fiction future many years ahead, but in our lifetime. Unless we act now, these consequences, disastrous as they are, will be irreversible. And these are not the voices of Chicken Little and Henny Penny. If someone dismisses climate warming to you as the sky is falling kind of talk, go back and read the book, Chicken Little, and see if you can find any intelligent comparison between mounting greenhouse gases and a little acorn falling on a chicken's head. If you look behind the statements of people that are doubting climate crisis, you will find more often than not that they are connected to the industry, the petroleum industry itself. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report in just February 19, or 2007 saying that climate change is unequivocal. A second report was issued in draft form in March 2007 discussing the catastrophic impacts of unchecked warming. 
And those reports compile the conclusions of more than 1,200 authors, 2,500 expert reviewers, and they reflect scientific expertise from more than 130 countries. The urgent warnings coming from all directions of science are intended to focus society on a decision now. So that's the bad news. What can we do about it? Encompassing as the problem is, global warming can be confronted by setting a firm national timeline for greenhouse gas reduction. And you can think of this not as law, but as nature's law, nature's carbon mandate. Scientists have defined this very clearly. First, we must take that rising trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions and we must reverse it, bring it down within a decade and probably sooner. Second, over the longer term, we have to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. Other countries and some of our own state governments are adopting these reduction goals. But it's one thing to set goals. It's another thing to implement them. Let me be very clear on this. These goals are not progressive. They are quantitative. Making progress towards meeting nature's mandate is clearly not enough. It will not be enough to avoid a temperature rise of 10 degrees. If Americans are to secure the future, they have to understand this carbon math as it is, as readily as they understand that four quarters equals a dollar. We have to bring these figures into the American mind. The carbon problem transcends so many sectors, residential, industrial, commercial, and so forth. We cannot meet this mandate without governmental leadership. Government is the huge engine that propels our whole society. We have thousands of agencies, indeed more than any other nation in the world. They exist at the federal, state, and local level. And collectively, these agencies hold immense staffing to solve environmental problems. If every one of these agencies made global warming a top priority, we might stand a chance of meeting nature's mandate head on. But to implement programs necessary to reverse our carbon emissions within 10 years, they have to start now. Tony Blair said, there is nothing more serious, more urgent, more demanding of leadership in our global community. So what is our government doing? It is driving this country towards runaway greenhouse gas emissions. County commissioners are approving trophy home subdivisions as if global warming didn't exist. State environmental agencies are approving air permits as if global warming didn't exist. The Forest Service is holding timber sales as if global warming didn't exist. Magnify this by the hundreds across the country and consider this. The electric power industry is racing to build over 150 coal-fired plants in this country across the United States. So that investment reflects their assumption that our own Environmental Protection Agency will grant permits under environmental statutes, allowing them to spew forth literally hundreds of millions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year as if global warming didn't exist. Every agency in this country is acting as if global warming didn't exist. Politics will change if citizens demand action, but those Americans who are awake to climate crisis are focusing their energy on reducing their own individual carbon footprint rather than holding their leaders accountable. And our, vital, our efforts are vitally important to do so, our individual efforts, but they also conceal a state of national chaos. We will not come into compliance with nature's mandate soon enough without governmental leadership. Our efforts alone cannot do that. The fact that most Americans are trying to solve global warming on their own tells us that we have lost our sense of governmental accountability in environmental issues. So in the remaining time frame left, I would like to suggest why our system of environmental law does not respond to climate crisis. And then I want to propose how we can reframe this uh, environmental law to demand the regulation we must have to meet nature's mandate. As we all know, to analyze any problem, you have to go way down to its roots. For the past three decades, we have looked to environmental law to, pass, to uh, address all of our problems. Environmental law consists of thousands of statutes and regulations that have proliferated since the 1970s. They uh, are meant to control just about any environmental harm you can think of. But before we turn to our environmental law, we need to face one fact. Had it worked, we would not have the crisis we have on our hands. Environmental law has delivered 
global warming and resource scarcity to our doorstep. It is crippled by enormous dysfunction, and if we don't acknowledge this dysfunction, we will be looking for a solution in the same crisis, uh, the same place that has brought us this crisis. The heart of the problem is this. While the purpose of every local, state, and federal statute is to protect natural resources, nearly every, every environmental law has also provided a permit system whereby agencies can allow environmental harm in their discretion. They can issue permits to allow such harm, the same harm that the statutes were designed to prevent. Now, of course, the permit systems were never intended to subvert the goals of the environmental statutes, but most agencies today spend nearly all of their resources to permit rather than prohibit environmental destruction. Essentially, our agencies have taken the discretion they have in the law and they have used it to destroy nature, including our atmosphere. Why would public servants who draw their salaries from the taxpayers do such a thing? It is because the call of private property rights is sounded in the halls of nearly every agency nearly every day. Asphalt plant operators and chemical manufacturers, land developers and timber companies, industrialists and investors of all sorts call out to those regulatory agencies not to draw the regulatory line on their activities. The private property rhetoric has cowered officials at nearly every level of government. So it's really no surprise that most agencies in America are acting as if global warming doesn't exist. Moreover, agencies have created so much complexity in their regulations with meaningless acronyms and techno jargon that citizens like you and me are not speaking in the clear and forceful terms that we need to to pose a counterweight to this private property rhetoric in the vast agency discretion realm. Our environmental law you can think of as this thick veil of complexity behind which agencies serve private interests often at the expense of the public. And our third branch of government, the courts, has been indifferent towards the politicization of agencies. Courts often defer to agency decisions on the false premise that those decisions are neutral. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court decided a case you've probably heard about in the papers called Massachusetts versus EPA, in which it held that carbon dioxide is a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. That was really no surprise to, to anybody except for the Environmental Protection Agency. But the, uh, the court handed the entire process back to the agency that's been recalcitrant all along. So we can't expect actual action on the ground from that agency that has resisted it all along. Without that third branch of courts um, fulfilling this function, what happens is our democracy becomes, in effect, an administrative tyranny over nature. And you might be wondering, how could this have happened? The explanation lies in the way industry and government has framed these laws. You can think of our environmental law with all of its complicated statutes and regulations as one big picture. The property rights movement has created a frame for that picture. The four sides of that frame are discretion, 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 to allow damage to our natural resources. Though our statutes have aspirational goals of protecting the environment, when they are carried out through that discretion frame, these statutes are used as tools to legalize damage to resources, and that's why we have uh, species extinction, air pollution, rivers running dry, dead zones in our oceans, and global warming. Too much agency discretion is a very dangerous thing. Consider how the U.S. government is using the discretion frame to justify inaction in the face of climate crisis. The EPA, which I mentioned just a moment ago, is the only, the Environmental Protection Agency, is the only federal agency charged by Congress to control air pollution, including things like carbon dioxide. But the EPA refuses to regulate. Viewed through the discretion frame the EPA has presented to the American public, <clears throat> the air is simply an object of regulation, a nebulous commons. And EPA has the discretion and can use it to allow pollution by the oil industry, gas, and automobile industries, no matter that this legalized pollution will degrade the atmosphere so much that it will no longer support civilization as we enjoy it. Because the discretion frame never characterizes natural resources as quantified property assets, it allows government to allow destruction of resources until they are gone. 
So how do we turn these agencies around and convince agency officials to use all of their authority to meet nature's carbon mandate? That's the question. Or put another way, how do we convince these agency officials who are working day to day to do what they currently consider to be political suicide? The public has to find a new frame for our existing statutes. Reframing environmental law does not mean throwing anything out. Again, these statutes give a tremendous bureaucracy that can address climate crisis overnight if, if we want them to. Reframing means taking control of the language and using that language to hold government accountable, to steer it back on course. Author George Lakoff says, reframing is changing the way the public sees the world. It is changing what counts as common sense. Social frames can be destructive or they can embolden and inspire. Unbelievable as it may seem, the future of our humanity rests on us being able to reframe government's obligation towards nature and towards our descendants. And we need to be able to do that reframing immediately. How do we reframe? We can reach back to timeless principles of property law that have been manifest on this and other continents. In fact, such principles that I'm going to talk about have grounded Supreme Court jurisprudence since the beginning of this country. But our agencies have lost sight of them in the last 30 years. In that last 30 years, these timeless principles have been pushed under by these, the proliferation of regulations that has sort of spread across the legal landscape, almost like an invasive species. These foundational principles are as crucial today in face of global warming as they were 200 years ago, because they clearly define government's obligation towards nature and towards our future generations. How do they do it? They present a trust, which is a term I'll use quite a bit. A trust is a fundamental type of ownership, whereby one manages property for the benefit of another. And long ago, the Supreme Court of our United States said that government, as the only enduring institution with control over our resources, is a trustee of those resources. And what does that mean? You can imagine all of the resources out there essential to our survival, the wildlife, the fish, the waters, the air, the forests, as being packaged together in a legal trust or endowment, which I call nature's trust. Our imperiled atmosphere is one of the assets in that trust the government holds. And government holds it for the benefit of all generations of citizens, past, present, and future. And so all of us are beneficiaries of that trust, and our grandparents were, and our grandchildren will be. We all hold a common property interest in nature's trust. This is your new property interest that you've just discovered, although you've held it all along. You can think of nature's trust as sort of a treasure to be passed down to future generations. With every trust, there's the core duty of protection. The trustee, remember that's our government, has the duty to defend the trust against injury. And where it has been damaged, the trustee has to restore the trust. Protecting our natural trust is more consequential than most things you'll find on the agendas of most officials today, because it has to do with the future of humanity. So it's not surprising that nature's trust principles were penned by judges long ago as the first environmental law of this nation. And this ancient strand of doctrine threads together virtually all of our environmental statutes. In fact, in the opening provision of the National Environmental Policy Act, which many of you know about, Congress declared national duty to, quote, fulfill the responsibilities of each generation as trustee of the environment for succeeding generations. So when we invoke the trust concept, we're not invoking anything new. The doctrine reaches back, literally, to Justinian times and Roman law. But on this continent, it reaches back much, much further. Just 150 years ago, the native nations controlled this territory. In fact, I just came from a, a wonderful Nez Perce ceremony down at Fort Vancouver. They were the sovereigns, the Nez Perce Nation and others, were the sovereigns that controlled all of this landscape that we now think of as the United States. And their laws actually did require uh, control of human behavior to secure resources for uh, generations, several generations distant. And though tribes did not describe their laws in Western terms, their governing sovereign mandate across all of Native America was, in fact, this trust mandate. 
In fact, it's so basic to law that this concept is found in many other countries today. In the Philippines, for example, um, 13 years ago, the Supreme Court of the Philippines invoked the same concept to halt rainforest logging. And in that particular case, the Philippines government contended that it had discretion, and you remember that term, discretion? Um, to allow the last logging of the, the logging of the last rainforest uh, that the Philippines had. There was only 2.8% remaining then. You see, every government that is captured by special interests invokes this discretion frame because it conveniently and, deli and invisibly delivers the natural wealth of that country to private interests. The Philippines enforce the people's trust, and this is what they said. This is from the Philippines Supreme Court. Every generation has a responsibility to the next to preserve that harmony of nature. The right to a balanced ecology concerns nothing less than self-preservation and self-perpetuation, the advancement of which may be said to predate all governments and constitutions. These principles are assumed to exist from the inception of humankind. In other words, the trust frame forces government to hand down that natural endowment to future generations and not give it away to private interests that happen to be knocking loudly at the government's door this generation. The trust principles are ingrained in our Supreme Court jurisprudence. In fact, the Supreme Court in 1892 said, and this is a quote, the state can no more abdicate its trust over property in which the whole people are interested than it can abdicate its police powers in the administration of government. But today, the national chaos we see over global warming is the government abdicating its trust over our atmosphere. So let's now take a look at how these two frames I've described, the discretion frame and the trust frame, differ in their implications for humanity because of global warming. In contrast to the discretion frame, the trust frame has the four sides of obligation, 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 obligation. We can take the very same set of laws and without changing a word of them, reframe government's obligation towards future generations on a policy, legal, and moral level. By reframing, we can turn government's discretion into an obligation to protect nature. This principle works in reverse as well, and it's important to know that now because we're seeing a lot of carbon legislation in the pipeline. We can take any new law we want, and if it is pressed through that discretion frame, the government will continue to impoverish natural resources until they are gone. So how do citizens actually reframe government's obligation towards nature at this pivotal time? They must expand their political imprint, not only reduce their carbon footprint on this side, but they must get out there and write letters and emails and contact and have face-to-face -face conversations with their officials and speak in very clear terms to all levels of government and take the time to do that today. Let me just show you how citizens up in McCall, Idaho um, took down this discretion frame and put up this trust frame to protect their airshed. This was a few months ago. The Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, which I'll call DEQ, had proposed to issue a permit for an asphalt plant up there that spews so much pollution into neighborhoods that literally mothers pull their little children inside day after day. And the DEQ was about to issue a permit to allow more of that pollution. This permit, delivered by the hand of environmental law, would allow the emission of, of something like uh, 54 toxins right into the airshed up there. Toxins like lead, mercury, arsenic, dioxin, chromium-6, formaldehyde, as well as more carbon pollution. Now, if you read the DEQ analysis, you would be hard-pressed to find any sort of statement that this pollution would damage the people or the airshed. Instead, that analysis was filled, like many are, with incomprehensible technical statements. The reader is just hit in the face with AACs, AACCs, TAP analysis, TRAC, HAPs, NESHAPs, SIPT, MACT, and more. Now, do any of you understand? Well, I think one person, two people do, but the rest of you, do the rest of you understand what those terms mean? Amidst that gibberish, there's really no core value we find driving government action. What did those people in McCall do? There was a hearing in January on that permit, and normally such hearings are filled with just a bunch of empty seats, and no wonder. But somebody, a couple days before up there in McCall, who worked, worked for a governmental agency, actually, handed out a flyer, and it said on that, flyer, air for sale, and that hearing room was packed. 
Now, there's no environmental group in McCall. These were not environmentalists who showed up. Um, these people were drawn together by a common airship. They were doctors and uh, cancer victims, retired people, ski team coaches, teachers, forest serv service employees, and, and mothers, and, and the like. When you translate the techno jargon into air for sale, you replace that discretion frame with the trust frame. And citizens suddenly feel like it's their property that's being trampled by their own government. They start thinking, hey, that's my air, even if I share it with some others. And pollution of that air shed becomes an infringement of American property. The frame makes a difference because it expresses our core expectations of government. So in the time remaining, I'd like to suggest how this trust frame gets the American mind around climate crisis and how it becomes a coalescing force. The first point I'd like to make has to do with Americans' in feeling of entitlement towards nature. This discretion frame, with all of its techno jargon, gives no real hint of environmental loss. The ARARs and TMDLs and TSDs and SIPs and HRSs and PRPs and RPAs and the hundreds of other ac acronyms that the government uses to hospice a dying planet really give no indication of what we are losing. They sound out no alarms. And this is because these terms are incomprehensible to the public. These terms present the atmosphere and whatever resource is at stake simply as a nebulous state of affairs. And so we could never imagine that the resources might be all spent down, all used up, no longer there for our children at some point in time. We seem unbothered even when our government leads us into full-scale climate catastrophe. But when we portray nature as a trust rather than this ill-defined commons, we vest citizens with the expectations of enduring property rights to a defined, bounded asset. Any damage to the trust becomes manifest because the trust resonates with people. Most people have heard of trust. Kids know about college accounts. Adults know about retirement accounts. And Americans are, in general, ferociously protective of their property rights. And so once they understand they have a property right in something, they are inclined to protect it. The trust frame has empowerment for youths, for children here today, because they can't vote. It gives them a property right, them, a property right to the natural inheritance of the world. Their right, even though they don't vote, to take this inheritance. It gives them, as beneficiaries with no lesser standing than our own, a right to the, nat the natural wealth that we have inherited. Children get very angry thinking about our generation spending down the natural wealth. Second, when we invoke the trust to explain global warming, we may be able to overcome denial. The cruel irony of climate crisis is that the most disastrous manifestations of it will occur after that tipping point has come and gone, after our window of opportunity has closed. And a daunting obstacle we all face is that most people don't view this as an immediate threat. For many Americans, the problem is so extreme, like an ice age, that they must seem like a science fiction movie. In fact, the more dire the environmental issue is today, the less it's likely to be taken seriously in the United States of America. Many people simply mock the messenger for spreading doom and gloom. Without a sense of immediate loss, the public will not feel the urgency to demand government leadership in the short time frame that we have left. There's this Harvard professor, Daniel Gilbert, that I like to sidelight because he suggests that our brains, our human brains, are hardwired to ignore global warming. He says humans evolve to these more immediate threats, like an enemy coming right over the hillside. Well, the discretion frame presented by our government capitalizes on this mental weakness because it lures people into complacency. People operating within this frame think of air way out there somewhere, way beyond that hillside. But people's perceptions change remarkably when they think of their trust, their trust, being mismanaged by government. That is an immediate concern, even if the effects won't be felt for years to come. Beneficiaries don't often sit idle when the trustee drains their trust. They understand collapse scenarios. They understand stocks crashing. They understand a freewheeling grandfather spending down the family inheritance. 
Recall that Philippines case I mentioned earlier. The Philippines Supreme Court presented the reality of a depleted natural trust by speaking in familiar terms of natural inheritance. It said simply, and this is a quote, the day would not be too far when all else would be lost for generations which stand to inherit nothing but parched earth incapable of sustaining life. There's no doomsday language there. This is about intergenerational theft. And we all know what theft is. Third, by defining nature in familiar property terms, the trust frame reconciles private property rights with environmental protection. The discretion frame doesn't do this. It portrays environment as sort of a nebulous aspect of the world we live in. Private property rights carry the day in our agencies simply because our tradition of private property is deeply embedded in the national culture. And so to confront any environmental crisis today it becomes very important to be very clear on how public resources fit with private property rights in the scheme of things. The trust frame is itself a property concept. So rather than pitting environment against property rights, you are fitting nature into the system of private property rights. The trust frame is not anti-private property rights. To the contrary, it assumes our collective rights in assets that support humanity. Every Supreme Court opinion invoking the trust makes clear that private property rights cannot um, be used to damage critical public resource, resources. In 1892, the Supreme Court said, and I love this quote, uh, it was in a case where a railroad threatened the shoreline of Lake Michigan. The Supreme Court said, it would not be listened to that the control and management of Lake Michigan a subject of concern to the whole people of the state should be placed elsewhere than the state itself. Can't you practically hear those same justices saying today, it would not be listened to that the government would allow our atmosphere to be so degraded that we cannot support civilization as we enjoy it. Let us not for a moment think that just because private property interests have to be regulated that this trust frame is anti-private property. In fact, in protecting public resources, the trust frame anchors all of our private property rights because all of them depend on nature's infrastructure. When that infrastructure collapses, it causes natural disasters that make property boundaries irrelevant. Remember, deeds did not account for much in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And finally, the trust frame has global reach. This is because global warming is, after all, a global problem. We have to deal with that. When we portray global warming to the American public, we have to be able to explain the role of foreign nations. Everybody knows that China is going to be bringing on coal-fired plants online, and they worry about that. And when Americans are forced to make changes in their own lives, a lot of people just say, I can't do anything. China is going to emit more carbon than I can ever compensate for. Well, the trust framework positions all nations of the world in a logical relationship towards nature. Transboundary resources, like the atmosphere, are shared as property among nations who are co-tenant sovereign trustees of those resources. They share the resources as co-tenants, similar to a family sharing a mountain cabin as co-tenants. Property principles have offered timeless ways of dealing with shared situations. And it's always imposed a responsibility on co-tenants not to degrade a commonly owned resource. This one concept lends definition to international responsibilities, whether we're talking about a shared fishery, an ocean, or the globe's atmosphere. And moreover, by talking in trust terms, the trust frame can be invoked by citizens of other countries who are trying to call their own governments to action. At a time when this world is so politically fractured, the trust frame offers hopes that citizens across the entire planet can view Earth's resources in the same light and defend it in their different languages but with one voice. So let me conclude and then I'll open it up for maybe a few questions. Citizens across this country are reeling from reports of climate crisis and many want to know what can we do. Citizens need to call their government, local, state, and federal, into action 
to bring those carbon levels down immediately. We have only a decade. And also to preserve the resources we still have. Every forest, every wetland, every species, every river is going to take on a premium because nature itself is living at the margins. Government at all levels should not waste another day responding to this crisis. But to call government into action, citizens have to speak in very clear terms through a very powerful frame. In An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore presents climate crisis as, quote, a moral and spiritual challenge for our generation. The trust frame is that obligation that springs from the heart of all humanity pressed into the institution of government. The same trust principles that flow through a judge's pen can be preached from a pulpit anywhere in the world or spoken from a grandmother to a grandchild anywhere in the world because the trust encompasses that moral obligation that transcends all governments, all cultures, all peoples of the world. And that obligation is not just another attribute of this frame. It is its enduring power for all time to come. So with that, I would like to conclude and open it up for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions from? How do you suggest um, common citizens go to their elected officials and restructure the frame from the discretion? Because as we know, most of the laws are still interpreted through the discretionary um, glasses that, have, that the agencies use. And you can beat your head against an agency for two, three, four, five years, and you're talking about getting a resolution in less than a decade. So you're, you need a sledgehammer as opposed to, you know, some sort of political uh, appeasement. Well, the question is, how can citizens actually do this in the short time frame left? This is a concept that can spread every bit as quickly as the private property rhetoric spread a couple of decades ago. And so what I would suggest is certainly um, using the laws that we have in addressing climate crisis, you absolutely have to use them. But not just talk in terms of SIPs and ambient air quality standards and, and criteria pollutants, but frame every interaction with every governmental agency person um, and elected official in trust terms, because these are moral terms that carry a lot more weight than meaningless acronyms. But I, I would never suggest abandoning environmental law because that is the hook. That's the legal hook that you need today. Um, nevertheless, we need a political fire, in essence, that will spread so fast and so quickly to communities across America that people will say, I have an entitlement to an, an atmosphere that will support me and my children for generations to come. And that sense of entitlement is what current environmental law is lacking. Yeah, I think, I think to, to start the fire moving, so to speak, the question is, isn't it more effective to go through YouTube and, and groups and community forums? The point is, we have no time to waste. It falls on every individual in this room and every individual out there to stop what we're doing and to find any avenue, YouTube, the state legislative offices, the media, the letters to the editor, the coffee shops, the dining room table virtually everywhere has to talk about global warming because we face an environmental crisis that is not giving us time to respond in the time we're used to taking. We're so consumed by business as usual, in fact, we're drugged by business as usual in a sense, to ignore the critical urgency of this threat. So I would agree with you, Dave, that we have to take this message out to the community, to the legislative offices, but also across the internet and in chat rooms and newsletters, 
But we can't just do tomorrow what we did today. If we do tomorrow what we did today, we continue our business as usual, which is driving us right down that path where the window will close and we will not know it, but the tipping point is near. The scientists say that we have to reverse that trajectory within this decade, these 10 years. And if we do tomorrow what we did today and don't spend the energy on global warming, we'll do the next day what we did tomorrow and we will just go right by that tipping point. Yeah. Cap and trade? Yeah. Um, is that slowing down or is that just keeping going business as usual? Well, the cap and trade mechanism, the question is um, how is cap and trade working? The cap and trade mechanism to address climate crisis has been criticized. The idea is that somebody cuts down here and another person can sort of buy their emissions, but you cap the overall. Um, Government needs to quantify the carbon footprint at every level. This county should be quantifying its carbon footprint, the state its carbon footprint, and then it's a simple mathematical uh, endeavor after that time. You have to bring that carbon down. The problem with uh, cap and trade that people have mentioned is that it's a little bit loose. It allows for people to kind of invisibly perhaps emit more. It's a very complicated thing. If we, if we all had a cap and trade going in this room, think of the difficulties of that, of enforcing our cap and trade. And there's you know, not that many people collectively we're dealing with here. And so magnify that across industries that are inclined, frankly, to do what's best for their short-term profits. That is the problem with cap and trade. So what I would like to get across to citizens is this is a matter of carbon math. It's not enough to get legislation in response to climate crisis. There's going to be a lot of politicians joining the bandwagon, going out and saying, hey, I've got this idea and this proposal and this will do this. You can't stop there. You have to literally get a quantification of the carbon heading downward and downward in time to meet both the short-term goal of reversing the trajectory in 10 years, but also the long-term goal, bringing carbon and greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And cap and trade, maybe it can accomplish that, but it's, it's a very complicated matter. Other questions? Yes, over there, over, oh, yeah. Go ahead. And that is May 9th? May 16th. I'm sorry. Why is that there? So on your way out, you want to explain that. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that there was another thing coming up that they could do to take um, some action. And I want to announce it here. May 16th. And where is the form? It's at Y East Middle School. Y East Middle School at what time? 5.30 to 7.30. 5.30 to 7.30 citizens have the opportunity to meet their legislative officials, the local through state, et cetera. And in meeting these officials, it's not enough to hear, oh, we're addressing the problem. I have yet to meet an official that says, I'm not addressing your problem. <laughs> and so that's, that's not even the beginning of the discussion. It takes carbon math. As I said, Americans need to know these quantifications as readily as they know that four quarters equals a dollar. So we have to leave those rooms, whether it's your room or another room, we have to leave those rooms with commitments and timelines and enforcement mechanisms. So we are assured the government is getting on board, treating this as a priority, and not duping us into thinking that the problem is solved. But there was another question. What are the levers that the levers that we have to accomplish that? 
Well, the question is how to take the thinking I've proposed, the trust thinking, to an international level, and what are the levers? And the international level has been very disappointing. The Kyoto Protocol was not signed on to by the United States of America, which produces 25% of the carbon emissions. So international law um, has not addressed this problem, and it probably will not in the time frame we're talking about. I think the best hope of taking this thinking internationally is that this is an organic concept that is present in many legal systems throughout the world. And as I say, it positions the various nations of the world as co-tenant sovereign trustees of a shared resource. So China has absolutely no grounds for arguing that it can destroy the resource when other countries come in line. What I've seen that is encouraging in this issue, and I want to say this, is that this, the first encouraging thing is that scientists have been very clear, not only about the urgency, but about what it takes. We could spend another decade debating what the numbers are, and we couldn't get started with the carbon math. But scientists have said, we have to reverse the trajectory within this decade, and we have to bring down carbon 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. What's encouraging is countries across the world, states across this country, can take those levels and start implementing them. They can take them as their responsibility as a co-tenant sovereign trustee, and they are. The mayor of Eugene, uh, my University of Oregon just announced um, a climate initiative that adopts that 80% reduction at the University of Oregon level. I've seen it adopted. You actually don't have it um, here in the state of Washington's governor's office yet, but you've got it from the state of Oregon's governor um, adopting these climate reduction levels, although the Oregon legislature has not implemented it. But at the very least, we have these levels that are clear. And that is something very powerful for the citizens to use now, because now we know what is our responsibility, both individually and as local governments and state governments and national governments. Yeah? That's a very good comment, and I'll just summarize it so that the rest of you can hear. Um, that we as individuals have consumptive lifestyles that are literally driving this earth towards disaster, and that we all individually have to cut back and bring our lifestyles in harmony with nature's needs. But I will add to that that um, a lot of people are making small steps. I run into these people every day, and they say, oh, I'm recycling more. Oh, I just started riding the bus. Those are wonderful, positive changes. but do they all add up? If I were a math teacher, I'd say there's no guarantee of that. That is why we need government to step in and oversee the actions that individuals are taking and to promote them. If you were to ride a bus in Eugene, Oregon now, you'd have a hard time. You'd have a hard time. There's no family safe bike paths either where entire families can commute by bike. They risk being hit by a car. So government has two, two responsibilities here. Number one, make sure the policies are in place to reduce that carbon quickly enough, make sure the carbon math adds up, but two, start developing overnight, literally, the infrastructure that's going to allow individuals to continue any semblance of their lives, and they can with government infrastructure. But all the money that's going into road projects could be going into different sorts of public transportation bicycle projects. It's not. It's not because most newsletters from most state legislators still have other items on the list, not that those are not important. We all value education, tax relief, um, other, other aspects of daily life, but the most urgent problem facing our society now is climate crisis. And if that is not number one on any local, state, or national 
elected officials or agency officials' agenda, if they are not addressing that on a daily basis, they're not hearing the message of the tipping point. Other questions? Yeah? Yeah, that's a great question. The question um, is, is basically, what do you do when an asset has been spent down or damaged? What if somebody comes and says, well, there's no more clean air, so there's no more trust to protect? And actually, I've seen those arguments. Well, the nice thing about the trust responsibility is there's a twofold duty. It's really easy to remember. One is to protect the asset from damage. The other is to restore the asset that's been damaged. If our air quality has been damaged through the operation of environmental law, every agency official in charge of air quality has the duty of restoring that air quality. Right now they do not see that duty because our Clean Air Act and every other environmental law that we implement today gives our public officials discretion to destroy that trust. In effect, the trust doctrine gives them the obligation to restore the damaged trust. And you might say, well, does this apply to other resources? Absolutely. We cannot go on putting in destination resorts, putting in trophy home subdivisions, putting in new roads, cutting that down force. We're, we're at the end of all that. And so this is a clear no more destruction mandate. Now, maybe there's some instances where you need to take a little bit for some societal need. But there's no, not even an inquiry into that at this point in time. So the trust requires going back towards restoration. And, and I just want to make that clear because most Americans have become accustomed to these environmental laws. And we wonder, why are we hitting our heads against the wall at every turn, whether you're talking about water pollution or a new subdivision or a new road through a forest? Why? why is it these agencies just have the almighty power to allow destruction? It's because the, the frame of discretion has given them that power. So that's, the trust frame really confronts that. Yeah, can, can trustees be sued for not carrying out their duty? I would absolutely guarantee you that if there were a private trustee of a trust that held assets of any, any kind of value, if the beneficiaries thought that that trustee were mismanaging the assets, that trustee would be in court. And so of course they can be sued. It, there is a common lawsuit against a government trustee for mismanaging assets. Now, having said that, there are cases out there but they usually predate environmental law. You see, in the 1970s, Congress was worried about our environmental problems and passed statutes like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and all sorts of statutes to protect our resources. And so these common law claims pretty much went away. The nuisance claims and the common law public trust claims, some of the cases I cited, those were old pre-statutory law claims. What's happened, though, in the last 30 years since those statutes, since the last you know, big environmental movement of the 1970s, those statutes have taken over. They have resulted in thousands of regulations being implemented by agencies across this country at every level of government. And the problem has been the statutes had, each one of them, this little permit section, which allowed agencies to issue permits to destroy resources. These agencies took those permit authorities and went into business as usual using permits 
to regularly and routinely destroy resources as business as usual. And so if you try to stop some sort of you know, development or timber sale as an American citizen using your environmental law, you're already fighting an uphill battle because that agency views itself as having the discretion to allow that damage. But prior to 1970, there were claims, a lot of them, against the government trustee for damaging resources. And there have been since. But it, because of our pr predominance of environmental statutes, most environmental lawyers have used the statutes instead. Yeah? So I'll repeat the, the question. Robert Kennedy Jr., who's a, a colleague of mine, actually, he's an environmental law professor himself. He teaches at Pace University. And I guess he's recently made the statement that the Environmental Protection Agency should be shut down because people in charge of running the agency have um, essentially a conflict of interest. Be and they're doing more damage running the agency as they are than they would if shut down. I think that's a very courageous comment on his part, and I couldn't disagree with it. And the reason I can't disagree with it is this. The people in charge of many of these agencies today have a clear uh, conflict against the American public in that they've come from industry. We don't know how much they may serve industry behind the scenes. We have no way of knowing. But we do know that the administration has close connections with industry. And so when you have the United States Protection Agency Agency, uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency out there saying, we will regulate your air quality. As citizens, it is hard for us to figure out if they're really doing that. This is an agency that has resisted regulating greenhouse gases since 1999. It refused a petition to regulate greenhouse gases back in 1999, and that is what resulted in the Supreme Court case that was just handed down three weeks ago. And so that the danger in having EPA run um, the, the pollution that destroys our atmosphere is that they may tell us they're doing the job and not really doing it. That's why I think the Supreme Court case really won't have any impact on the ground, although it held that carbon dioxide was a pollutant, the EPA would have to regulate if it found it endangered the public. When EPA comes back with its techno jargon and acronyms, um, there will be a veil of complexity and we won't really know what its regulations accomplish, and by that time it'll be too late. The, the positive side of that, though, is that citizens across this country have local government and state government that they can turn to and they can take these numbers I've given you, turn down the trajectory, and bring the levels down 80% by 1990. And citizens across this country can, at a local level, get a city's carbon footprint and county's footprint and get a local action to turn that carbon down. That is what people are starting to do now. That is positive. The question is, what would it take to get to that level, the, the long-term level I'm talking about, and um, what, was, what was it like the last time we were there? Um, the level has been endorsed by the head of the United Nations and several countries around the world. The technical way of expressing it is 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And that, again, I want to reiterate, is the long-term goal. The short-term goal, to me, is much more urgent because we are reaching a tipping point where if we go beyond that, we can't retrieve any, we can't salvage climate security. So I almost, I'm going to answer your question, but I almost view the short-term mandate as the more essential one, get that carbon down, because right now it's rising 2% a year. So what would it take to achieve that level? Um, you know, the technology is there to achieve a huge chunk of it already. There are professors um, out of universities who have created the wedge concept 
they have looked at the trajectory of carbon and they've figured out different wedges of activities that could bring it down. Um, those wedges are, for example, converting to wind power, having more public transportation, more home efficiency. And so it's not just one action, it's a whole lot of actions. I'm inclined to say had we started this effort 20 years ago when we should have, we would not even notice the difference in our lives. I can't say that anymore because we have squandered the last 20 years. Um, and so it's going to make differences in our lives. But if we wait until tomorrow and day after tomorrow to address this problem, the catastrophe that's going to visit Americans in our lifetimes and then our descendants um, will make us wish that we had addressed the problem long before. It will be, we will not even think of the conveniences we enjoy today. No, not, oh, in other words, what would it look like to have 80% below 1990 yeah, levels? What was the last year we were at that, you know, at that level? And I, I don't know the answer to that question, when were we last at that level? I know it is achievable with government leadership using the kind of concept that you, you take one slice of that trajectory at a time and, I mean, bring them down all at once, but we need changes across our transportation sector, our energy sector, um, residential sector. And if we've got government officials doing nothing to address this crisis, and they're out there worried about education, health care, very important concerns, but they are not acting to implement this carbon lockdown within the decade, our, the changes we will have to effectuate if we wait are much greater than what we will have to do if we get started now. And I'm sorry I can't answer your question oh, precisely in terms of the year we were last there. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned that many citizens in the United States don't recognize the dire threat. And, uh, and I was just wondering how we should simply share with each other, like with people that may not recognize that, a simple way to communicate to them, how they can understand how it is a real threat, and how we can help spread that political flyer you were talking about to the community to help enact the change that you're talking about. Okay, how to, the question is how to convey to people that this is such a threat. I think when you have the, um, the lead climate scientist from NASA um, stating, and I quoted his statement, that we have 10 years, not 10 years to decide upon action, but 10 years to fundamentally reverse the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. That's a statement my eight-year-old quotes almost every day. So when you have that kind of statement in the mass media, and, and it's there now, I would be quoting that statement everywhere to all Americans. Now some Americans will still say, oh, is climate crisis real? There are some people who cannot mentally grasp this problem. They can't emotionally grasp it. Leave them behind. Take the ones that grasp it and go with them and get their energy. Um, because at this point in time, if people are still in denial, they want to be in denial and we probably can't do much about them. They probably are carrying some kind of approach to life that we just, no matter what we say, we, we cannot bring the reality to them today. But I would quote uh, Jim Hansen, head climate scientist for NASA, and his statement. Any other questions? Uh, my, um, oh yeah, one more question. How important this petition is and how many signatures do you need to gather to make an impact? And I won't answer with respect to this particular petition, I will just answer generically. When you're talking about citizens moving governmental officials, every signature counts from children as well as adults. Because children can sign petitions, um, and they should because their future is on the line in global warming. Uh, they've got more of a future ahead of them than we do, presumably. And so, in every community, there ought to be petitions. There's a, a website, a national website, called Step It Up 2007. Step It Up 2007. Um, it's a website that's easy to access. I think um, that it represents sort of the front lines in responding to climate crisis. And you will go on that and see um, efforts from citizens around the country trying to get their local and state governments to respond to climate crisis. Very yeah. yeah, absolutely. 
Um, obviously, there's no magic tipping point in terms of how many signatures will move the legislature, but the more the better, obviously. We've been circulating these petitions as events in the last several weeks, so the names you see here are not by any means the sum total of all the signatures we have. And if you have not signed it yet, please do so. I'll leave it on this table right here with Mary's finished, so you can sign it. And you know, essentially, obviously, Washington State's a relatively small carbon 